Franklin Church in Fort Scott in 2012, and my family moved to North Idaho about two years later. <laughs> Um, Pastor Matt is passionate about Caravas of Life and Ministry across the traditional lines from like religion, denomination, politics, federation, Hoshi or Hermetics, or any other demographic agenda. He has served the church in a variety of roles and in very diverse congregations, including churches in Northwest Washington, Massachusetts, Los Angeles, Haiti, Minnesota, Denver, and St. Paul. Beyond being trained as an ordained pastor, Matt has degrees in engineering and church history and is a certified mediator. In addition to connecting people with the love of Jesus, he is passionate about helping people live the God life of Jesus while disobeying the law. Matthew helps family, neighbors, co-workers, and others to be just proud of Jesus' work and helps create a new world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, I'm super glad to be here. Um, so I understand this is a series. How many of these have you had so far in the series? Oh my. Here? Yeah. Uh, number four, number four. I'm number four. Okay, excellent. So I, I think <laughs> you're going to notice there's some differences between where we're going and what we're doing. So just so you know, I'm not going to assume that any of you happen to be people of faith. Um, and I'm not going to assume that you're not people of faith. Um, most of what I say, uh, really all of what I say, applies equally to people of faith and people who are uh, not of faith. And part of that is because as Lutherans, we believe in what's called the priesthood of all believers, which also extends to non-believers. That everybody can be speaking the word on behalf of God, even if they don't believe it themselves. And so uh, you are agents of God's work. And I want to just say thank you so, so much for the, the incredible work that you do in the sacred moments in people's lives, in their homes, in these sacred rooms over here. When you come into those places that are, uh, we were just talking that death brings out the best and the worst of people and not much in between. And so uh, I'm curious, um, for those of you that are here, have you felt like um, in your work uh, that you have been coming into more conflicted situations over the last few years than you have in previous times? Is that, or is it the same, or is it less? It's probably a little more. A little more? Yeah, maybe not a whole lot. Well, here's kind of where we're going to go. We're going to just tell you a little bit about my background. We're going to talk about church history in a nutshell, and that's just so that we can unpack why it is that all these churches are different and what makes them different and, and why. We're going to talk a little bit about some Lutheran distinctives and traditions, including our emphasis on grace and forgiveness, sacraments, uh, and liturgy and hymns. And then I'm going to give you some, some concrete tools that you can use for uh, providing care um, and for uh, just <laughs> loving, loving families that are uh, in the midst of death and dying. Trying to find a good angle just because... The podium's here. Do you want? I can move this further. Would you move? Would you mind moving it over here? To your over, but then I'm, am I going to be right in front of this? Nope. That's okay. so much better. That's better. Thank okay. you. All right. Excellent. So uh, Jeffrey shared a little bit about me, but here's you know I'm a I'm a husband, um, and so this is my wife Sarah. I when I do these things, I try to put the most recent picture I have in my phone. So this was a fuzzy picture of my wife and I at White House Grill, the first time we had a date without kids in a while. Uh, so uh, that was good. Uh, I'm a dad. I've got four kiddos um, and I'm a son and my parents are in their 70s and I've um, been through the death and dying process with my own grandparents and been at the side of family members um, as uh, they moved on to eternity. Uh, I'm a sinner. Um, I'm a divorced man, and uh, anybody who's been married know you're not married without sinning. And if you've ever, all of lives are touched by divorce. And, um, you know, so I, I am far from perfect in my life now or ever. But I am also a saint um, that God has claimed me and said, uh, you are just right. And claimed me and said, you are perfectly clean 
um, not because of who I am, but because who God is. I'm the pastor at Calvary Lutheran Church. Calvary Lutheran's been around for 61 years. I've been there for 13 years. Um, we're a smaller congregation um, compared to some in this community, but we are a vibrant congregation, very cross-generational. I was a church planter in Colorado. I went to Luther Seminary where I have a degree in church history. You're going to see some of that in a little bit. Uh, I studied at Lund University, and part of that was studying the work of a particular pastor amidst a great conflict in the Church of Sweden, and that's part of my passion for conflict resolution. Um, I was a chaplain at a locked geriatric psychiatric facility, and um, so we uh, at that facility, um, I was the first chaplain they had had there in a long time. Nobody knew what to do with me. I didn't know what I was doing. And you'll hear a few stories about that as we go along. Um, but most of the folks that were there were struggling with memory impairment. Um, and that expressed their frustrations, expressed themselves often in acts of violence. And so they couldn't be in a typical memory care facility. So that was our typical patient there. Uh, I also have a master's of theology from Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, which is an evangelical seminary in the sort of Billy Graham stream of American evangelicalism. Uh, I served in Los Angeles as a youth minister for five years, and I have a degree in engineering from Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And if you can say that five times fast, you're, you're doing good. And I'm a farm kid. Um, I grew up on a farm in Western Washington, though I was born in Pullman. So. That's a little bit about who I am. So I'm just curious, um, some of who you are, can, are you comfortable just sharing with me a little bit about your roles uh, with Hospice of North Idaho? Can a few of you, not maybe all of you, but um, what are some of the roles that we have present here? You're in front, so you get the gallery treatment. <laughs> I'm the volunteer coordinator, and this is one of my veteran volunteers. So we're gonna do a veteran recognition later today. Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah excellent, thank you, yeah. Sure. I'm the I'm a hospice care liaison, so I'm out in the community a lot doing, you know, development and um, doing a lot of outreach on the clinical and community end. And personally, I'm a, I'm a Presbyterian too, so this is something I'm looking forward to. Yeah. Anybody else comfortable sharing? Chaplain. Chaplain. Spiritual care coordinator. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Social worker. Also. Social worker. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. I think. Social worker. social worker, social worker. This is social worker, Rose. You're all right in mind. I like that. Excellent. Yeah. Well, you know, you you don't work for a place like North Idaho, Hospice of North Idaho, unless you have compassion and patience and a love of people. And so, um, what you do is is sacred. I want to just touch a little bit on church history. So um, we say that the church started at Pentecost. That's 50 days after Easter. So Jesus rose. He hung out for 40 days. He ascended to, to heaven. And then there were 10 days where the disciples still were like, uh, I don't know what to do. Uh, I don't know what to do. And then Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit came and filled them. And all those things start, started moving. Uh, after Pentecost... There was an era called the apostolic era, and the apostolic era is when people who had seen Jesus uh, while they were alive were still alive. And so people could come to them and say, tell me that story again about Jesus. Remember that time when, when grandma saw Jesus and was healed by Jesus, and so those were all alive. And at the end of that, people really needed to um, figure out how do we share these stories beyond this? And so there were all of these letters that were going around, and those ended up coming together. And that was the, the early church era. And that early church era was marked by some of the, the first controversies where people had to decide, well, what, is it, what does it mean to be Christian, and what does it not mean to be Christian? And, and part of how that worked itself out was there were these lists of what are the letters that represent the teaching of the apostles, the writings that represent the teaching of the apostles and, and which ones don't, because there were so many letters and writings and ver gospels and this. And so while the Bible didn't exist as a book all bound together yet, these lists over the years got tighter and they became the same. And so that's how we ended up with our, our New Testament. 
And then about the year 312, this guy named Constantine was in a battle and his mom had, was a Christian. And so he had been hearing from his mom relentlessly about Jesus. He was one of those pesky moms that was like, you're going to get your back to church. Right. And, um, and he had a conversion experience. And so then eventually he becomes emperor. And uh, Constantine is not the one who turned the Roman Empire into a Christian empire. That was his kids who were also named Constantine. So there's confusion there. Um, he believed in a pluralistic empire. And so, but what he did is he created freedom of religion, particularly for Christians, where there was no freedom of religion for Christians before. His kids, on the other hand, figured out this thing that, aha, if we make everybody follow the same religion, then we can manipulate people for this for political purposes. And so in that Roman Empire, we have the first use of uh, religion as a real political manipulation tool. Um, then you come about 700 years later and there are some people from all over what is the known world and they get together for what's called one of the councils of Nicaea and they come up with what's known as the Nicene Creed. And the Nicene Creed uh, is basically saying, what do Christians believe? If you can point to this and affirm this, then you're a Christian. And if you can't, you can't. And there was one little phrase that after the, the whole thing ended, the then Pope at the end the, and the Roman side, the Western church said, we're gonna add this one little phrase. And actually it was just one word, filioque. They added that to the creed, and it said that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father and the Son. They added this, and the Son. And the Eastern Church, which was based in Constantinople, said, we didn't agree to that, you jerks. And that was the first major split. So now you have the Eastern Church, and you have the Western Church. We have uh, St. John the Baptist, Antioch, and Orthodox Church is in post fall, so you may in your work come across some Orthodox Christians, um, and this is where that was the first great divide. Orthodox Christians uh, evolved into a, a little bit more of a mystery, mystical sort of thing, um, and the Western Church then became what was the Roman Catholic Church. So then, do you have a question? No, I just said interesting. Yeah, so now we're moving forward, and we get uh, a little bit further into the 11th and 13th century, and now again, people start thinking, hey, you know what? If, if we push the right religious buttons, we can get people to do almost anything we want. And so there were people who at first, the first crusade probably was a crusade that was genuinely felt that, hey, Jerusalem um, is, needs to be rescued. It needs to be under Christian control. We need to, there's all this holy stuff there and we need to go and rescue the Christians that are living in Jerusalem because Christians were being oppressed in that area. But after the first crusade, people figured out, hey, there's a lot of money to be made in this war business, right? Does that sound familiar? There's a lot of money to be made in the war business. Even when war is the best solution, even when it's the only solution, there's a lot of money to be made. And so um, people started manipulating Christianity for political purposes and to make money. Uh, so then you come along and we still have just two churches. You've got the Eastern Church and the Western Church. The Western Church is the Roman Catholic Church. And there's this guy, Martin Luther, and he's a monk and he's struggling um, with his faith. And he, he's seen some things going on in the church and he's convinced that the Pope, if he knew what was going on with the church, um, then he would fix these things. So... He writes these things called the 95 Theses, Theses, 95 observations about things that are going on, particularly with this practice of selling indulgences. And um, he posts it on the church in Latin, and he sends a copy to the Pope and says, hey, we're, we're friends, we're going to get along, right? And the Pope um, said, uh-uh. <laughs> so that devolves um, eventually. Uh, Martin Luther is excommunicated, there's a price on his head, and Luther starts in the midst of this, starts reevaluating all of his theological opinions, and he, he comes to 
a very different understanding of how the church works than from the Roman Catholic Church. And so this is the beginning of the Reformation. Out of the Reformation, you've got Lutherans, you've got Presbyterians. There's also the Anabaptist movement, which includes Mennonites, which are part of this Reformation movement. You have um, a number of other little groups that are um, mostly coming out of Germany and Northern Europe that are all part of this Reformation movement that are about reforming the church uh, into something that is uh, closer to what the scriptures are teaching. And then amidst that, you have the formation of the Church of England, which is slightly different because it's not a separation based on, of course, theological understanding, but on, well, I really want to divorce this, this person. And the Pope says, I can't, right? So again, we've got this sort of political motivation. Now, just because something starts out in sort of a nefarious way doesn't mean that it continues that way, right? So the Church of, the Church of England may have started out with, you know, sort of this shady thing about just wanting a divorce. But that doesn't mean it stayed that way. But that did mark what it would go on to become. All of those traditions, so your Presbyterians, your Lutherans, your Anabaptists, which would eventually kind of grow into what we would call Baptists here in the United States, um, all of those that aren't Orthodox and aren't Roman Catholic are Protestants. Now, most of us will say, we're not protesting anything. We're not, a, I'm not a Protestant. So if you talk to a Baptist, they'll say, I'm not a Protestant. So it can be a, it was meant as a derogatory term and some of us still receive it that way. Um, I was visiting with a activities director at a assisted living facility um, where I'd done some work and she was a new activities director. And I said, oh, here's some of the things I've done with, with you in the past. And um, she said, well, what are you? I said, well, I'm Lutheran. And how's that different from Christian? Well, we're all Christian, right? So you've got this broad spectrum now. So you've got the Orthodox Church, you've got the Roman Catholic Church, and you've got all of these Protestants. We're all Christians, right? And, and so all of us can point back to, before that Nicene Creed, there's a creed called the Apostles' Creed. And if you go to a church that's got any sort of hymnal, many churches use it in their worship periodically. Some churches don't do communion very often. But, or you talk to your pastor and you say, hey, do we agree with the Apostles' Creed? Uh, all of these churches would agree with the Apostles' Creed. So, um, so now we're gonna move to the United States in our, and there's so much more in there, right? <clears throat> so we've got the colonial era and we have what's called the First Great Awakening. And what's going on in the United States is you've got all of these people that are from all of these different traditions, but there's all of this land, all of this colonists. And so uh, they're all kind of working together. And so you've got Lutherans and you've got uh, Calvinist Presbyterians and you've got Church of England folks and some people that broke away from the Church of England who are now calling themselves Methodists. And they're all working together and they're... The United States is becoming more and more Christian, and it's really exciting, man. We're just like, oh, oh yeah, Christianity is good, right? And, and it was good for a lot of people. There were some people that, that it wasn't great for. Um, and so there's all of this collaboration, and so everybody seems to be getting along, with the exception of some of the Roman Catholics who are doing their own thing. They're not really in conflict because everything's so spread out that you can kind of do your thing here and they'll do their thing here. But coming out of Louisiana and places like that, you've got all these Roman Catholics. Then we have what's called the Second Great Awakening. And the Second Great Awakening is where all of a sudden people start bringing in what you might hear referred to as fire and brimstone preaching. And, uh, or what would be called by church historians, the new measures. And the new measures were about, and I don't want to be pejorative about this because it's not my tradition, but it's about making sure people know that the consequences of not following Jesus are hell and damnation and, and eternal hellfire and suffering and pain and stuff. So it was uh, an emphasis on here's the consequences if you don't follow Jesus um, rather than uh, here. Traditionally, the way the church had been teaching the faith was 
not sort of the, the scare tactics as much as much as, um, hey, here's what it means to be a Christian, here's why it's good, and things like that. This came a great split. And so people that were part of this great consortium of Christians started breaking off into other ways. So out of this movement, we have more of what we have as the Baptist tradition in the United States. Also grow, going out of this tradition, we have um, some of the dispensational traditions. So um, there's a tradition that started in England, but really took off in the United States. That's similar to if you've ever read or heard of the Left Behind books or this idea of the rapture. That's a theology called dispensationalism. And, um, and so that sort of group kind of split from what would become the mainline churches. The mainline churches were churches with money. They were on the main streets. Those included the Episcopal Church or the Church of England, the Methodists, the Lutherans, the Presbyterians. Um, they had the big churches in town. They had been established a little lot longer, and they had more to lose if things went sideways. And then uh, we had in 1844 what was called the Great Disappointment. So out of this group of people that were sort of more in the, uh, the Baptist uh, group, there was this group of people who had uh, figured out when Jesus was coming back. And so they went to a mountain in Maine, and they sat up there for a long time, and they first thought, well, he's only a day late. Uh-oh, he's a week late. And then eventually, and there were like 100,000 people sitting on this mountain in Maine waiting for Jesus to come back. Out of this movement came the Seventh-day Adventist tradition and Christian Adventists. And we have a lot of those in this community. There are a lot of Adventists. And so uh, now they no longer believe that they you're supposed to figure out when Jesus is coming back, but they still have a wonderful emphasis on this urgency of Jesus could come back anytime. And that's both exciting because, man, Jesus, come back quickly. This is, please, please, the world is so messed up. We need you right now. Come back quickly. And also there's this urgency to share the gospel with those who don't know very urgently because you don't want them to be left out. Um, and so that's coming out of that uh, great disappointment. And then we had uh, the fundamentalist modernist controversy. And so this was, uh, there was a thing called the, Scope, the Scopes Monkey Trial. Have, have any of you heard of the Scopes Monkey Trial? So this was a huge deal in the United States where because there was and this may sound familiar because this is still going on because there was a textbook that said, hey, people evolved from uh, monkeys. And then uh, th this other pastor said, no, that can't be. The and they had this big public debate called the Scopes Monkey Trial. And it was about this idea about evolution versus uh, reading the Bible literally. And out of this came a <laughs> bunch of little booklets called the fundamentals, and there were seven of them. And then there became more, and they were, these are the fundamental things that you have to believe if you are a real Christian. And so they took what had been a different creed and said, no, nope, we're gonna narrow the creed and here's what it means to be a Christian. And they included in that a literal seven day creation of the earth, um, the virgin birth and several others. And some of those I can affirm readily um, but I, as a Lutheran, I don't affirm those as necessary to believe in order to be a Christian. And so what the, the fundamentalist movement, out of that comes the King James Only movement. Um, and because all of a sudden around the same time, there were lots of new translations of the Bible coming out and people, you know, this doesn't, this isn't grandma's Bible. And so you had this whole King James Only movement that came out of that. And so there are still fundamentalist um, congregations, and there are several of those in our community. And so uh, this was a, a big turmoil in the United States. So now you have in the United States sort of three groups. You have the mainline churches, which includes the Lutherans. You have the sort of 
Baptist, um, uh, new measures, fire and brimstone churches um, that are more willing to, to emphasize here are the consequences if you don't become a Christian. And now you've got, as a break off from that group, the fundamentalists. Well, one of the things that happens is we as Americans, we want to believe that we all get along. And so this guy came to, named Billy Graham came along and he had what he called a crusade in New England, where he went around to these various New England towns and then on Boston Common, he had this big gathering and it was the largest public gathering of people uh, in one place in the United States that had been recorded at the time. And uh, so out of this, Billy Graham and another guy named Harold John Ockengay, they started this group that they called Evangelicals for Action. And that would eventually evolve into the National Association of Evangelicals. And that was the beginning of what would be the evangelical movement. And it was sort of a conglomeration of we had some people from the mainline churches and we had some people from the fundamentalists and some people from the other, they all formed. And they said, we're evangelicals. And they had different ways of defining that. Um, but it was focused on how do we read the Bible um, and what authority do we put the Bible in the church? Um, next, we have what's called the Azusa Street Revival. This is pretty recent now. We're in 1906. And uh, in California, in Los Angeles, there's this little church. And all of a sudden, people start speaking in tongues. And miracles start happening. And people get healed. And um, for years, this thing just explodes. And this is the beginning of the Pentecostal church. So you have the Pentecostal church, which is uh, you have the Assemblies of God, and there are some other Pentecostal churches. And so sometimes if you're working with a family and you might have somebody come and they're praying over mom or dad or, or whatever, and they'll start speaking in tongues. They're from this tradition. Yeah. I grew up in these churches. Yeah. And... I don't know, a few years back, his son was wanting somebody to come and speak tongues with his mother. Yeah. I called 20 people before I found somebody. Wow. Tongues, which surprised me. Yeah. You know, and of course, I went to, you know, um, right. Assembly of God and Pentecostal churches first, but it was harder than I thought it was going to be. So what's interesting about that, so I have a, um, I have a good friend who's an uh, Assemblies of God pastor. And, and some of the Assemblies of God congregations in our community, you wouldn't guess would be Assemblies of God. So um, uh, Lake City Church is an Assemblies of God church. Um, they practice charismatic gifts in very limited ways there. Um, the altar is an Assemblies of God church. They practice charismatic gifts in some other more often, but they've got so much of their own stuff going on there. Um, so yeah, it really it really does vary. Um, out of this also came sort of a merger with the holiness movement. And so you had um, these Methodists that really got, and Nazarene churches that really got involved with, well, we need to live holy, pure lives. And so that part of that, there was a merger. So you can see there's all of this break, split, break, merge, break, split, merge, break. And um, so then, uh, you get to 1980, and you have the founding. This is, church historians call this the, the, the beginning, the benchmark of what we would call the mega church era. Um, so before this, there were big churches, but not really big churches, right? And so Saddleback Church in Southern California is, it wasn't the first, and it, you know, it's not the, the, but it's the best known. So that's why it's, it's used that this is um, the purpose driven life, the purpose driven church all came out of this. So if you ever went to a church that read any of those books or used those books, or if you've read those books that came out of Saddleback Church. And so now there's a different emphasis on um, how do we uh, use the tools that the consumer model of the world has figured out um, in order to bring people into relationship with Christ, right? So marketing people have come up with these really wonderful things. Why shouldn't we use those 
for the sake of the kingdom of God. And that was kind of the, the emphasis of, or is the emphasis of the mega church movement. Um, and uh, then in 1988, you have the forming of the Christian coalition. Um, you might remember, you know, Newt Greenbridge, Ralph Reed. Um, and so here you had a group of people who got together and not all of them were actually Christian, got together and said, hey, all of these Christians are sort of doing their own thing. We could mobilize them if we found the right things to mobilize them. And Pat Robertson was a big part of this. And, um, and so they thought, well, let's mobilize these. And they picked two issues that they thought they could mobilize people around. And there's great books that document these, these meetings. And the two issues they picked were uh, traditional marriage and, uh, and abortion. Those were the two issues that they picked. And we're going to rally people around this and churches thought we're getting, this is good. We can get people unified around some really important things. And it wasn't that people didn't care about these things or these aren't important things, but they were the things that these people used to, to mobilize the church for political purposes. And so then the church really in the United States and the church has been used for political stuff, right? Since, for, the, beginning. since the beginning, right? Since Constantine's kids, right? So um, this isn't something new, but it was a new thing in the United States to be done on this level and on this national scale. And so that caused splits because then there were these people that thought, well, we shouldn't be involved politically. We're quietists or we should be more involved politically. We got to fight for these things and they're worth fighting for. And so there was more splits. And then uh, most recently, the biggest thing has just been really a focus on issues of um, LGBTQ plus uh, community and how do we treat and how do we love and and what are the, the appropriate ways and inappropriate ways and how does that all work? So I share all of this in part. Um, so first of all, you might have seen your own tradition in there, and I hope that you didn't hear me um, pejoratively talking about your tradition, right? Um, so for instance, I'm Pat Robertson is no longer with us, right? He's somebody who I disagree with theologically, dramatically. Um, there are things that he has said that I'm like, oh, brother Pat, please just close your mouth sometimes, right? Um, but there are things about him that most people don't recognize that I, I love about that man. And I, I am, he, he is an incredible person in so many ways. So an example is if you remember when Katrina hit New Orleans, and that morning he said that this was God's punishment uh, on the city of New Orleans, and that was a big controversy. And what didn't get publicized is that Pat Robertson had his own aid organization. His aid organization was the first one there providing clean water and food and medical assistance to people, the very first. Before any government aid, before any other church aid group, before anybody else got there, Pat Robertson had, before he got on television, he had made the phone calls, he had said, before the storm was over, get our people as close as they can, so as soon as the storm is over, we need to help people, right? So, uh, there, there's a sinner and a saint in my mind, right? Did he get it right all the time? Uh, in my mind, no. <laughs> um, if he would look at, at my ministry, he'd say, oh, brother Matt, you idiot, <laughs> right? Uh, but, um, you know, so he, part of my story is that while I disagree with people about really important things and they're worth disagreeing with, um, it's also really helpful to understand where they're coming from. Any questions about all of this? You can, yeah. Do you have any thoughts about Trump and his base? Uh, no. I have so many thoughts, but we're not going to share them now. Yeah. Um, not, not hopeful, yeah. No, but, but part of this is you can see all of these traditions that come from all of these divides in history going back, you know, sometimes 60 years, sometimes 100 years, sometimes 1,000 years. That, that are present in our community, right? So we have in this community, we have not only uh, an Orthodox church, right? And then we've got the Roman Catholic, the traditional Roman Catholic church, and then we've got Latin, right? 
Roman Catholic Church, and then we've got Immaculate Conception, which is a whole nother sort of Roman Catholic Church. We've got here um, multiple kinds of Presbyterians, lots of different kinds of Pentecostals. We got more Baptists than you can shake a stick at. We got non-denominationals. We got denominationals that pretend to be non-denominationals, and we've got four flavors of Lutherans. So when I talk about my flavor of Lutheran, it's not the same, right? So here in Kootenai County, we have four flavors of Lutherans. So I'm part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. For the time being, we're the largest Lutheran denomination in the country. We're also the fastest shrinking, yay. Uh, and um, so then we also, so the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America is theologically the broadest, but also uh, includes in that those streams uh, more progressive, more liberal. Neither of those terms really work very well. Streams as well as more traditional. We are a tradition that ordains women and uh, embraces women in um, all roles of ministry. Um, also, we have Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Uh, so that would be Christ the King and Shepherd of the Hills. And so they are in many ways very similar to us. They are the next biggest Lutheran tribe in the United States. Um, they are a narrower perspective, not narrower and narrow-minded, just firmer boundaries about here's who we are. They know who we are and what they're not. And if you're not, they say, well, that's wonderful, but you're not us, so that's fine. <laughs> um, they don't ordain women and they have some more traditional views about other things than we do. We also have uh, on Myers right over here, we have Peace Lutheran Church. That's part of the Lutheran Congregations in Mission for Christ. That was formed in a split from my congregation and from another ELCA congregation uh, over the issue of how do you treat people who are part of the LGBTQ plus community? Um, and how do we read scripture around that? And so they ordain women, and in many ways, they're very similar to us, um, but they're a little bit different tribe. And then we have uh, a Lutheran church called the Vine that's in town in Cordell. They might be in Haiti. Uh, but anyway, they're in the community, and they're part of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran um, Church. And they are um, more on the traditional conservative end of things and uh, narrower and um, narrower in scope than the, the Missouri Synod. And all of these come out of this stuff that we've talked about. How do you read the Bible? How do you understand creation? How do you understand the roles of women, right? Now, these are things that are, in my mind, most of them not things that define Christianity. They're worth arguing about. They're important, but they aren't what makes us Christian or not Christian. Um, so, yeah. You have to remember, we serve them all plus. Exactly. Without, you know, putting our stuff on that. Right. So, currently in Kootenai County, we do not have any, this is why it's a little bit important, is you have, you have a, a client and they say, hey, I'm a Lutheran, can you get a Lutheran pastor? Well, you might ask, is there a specific church that you'd like me to, to reach out to? And they might say, no, no. And um, and part of that might be because, you know, they haven't been to church since they moved here two decades ago. But they're still Lutheran. They still identify. They're still looking for that Lutheran right. Right. touch, right? And so then um, here, you're lucky. You, you're not going to accidentally call uh, a church that has a woman pastor and a woman pastor show up and they're not going to say, you're not a pastor, right? Um, but, you know, it's very plausible that in the near future, there could be a Lutheran woman pastor in the community. And you might just need to ask that question if you're thinking about which churches am I going to call. Um, and So what other questions would we ask? Okay, so that would be a great question. Church, are you comfortable with a woman pastor? Yeah, are you comfortable with a, a woman pastor? Um, you know, I, I regularly serve Lutherans um, who I don't come in and say, I'm an ELCA pastor, I'm not going to serve you, right? 
Um, and that's that's fine. And if they they ask, I'm lucky because I also have this sort of evangelical credential where I can say, well, I'm an ELCA Lutheran, but I I went to that evangelical seminary and they're like, oh my gosh, right? Um, but you can ask the word that they might you might ask are what denomination or synod. So people that are from a Missouri synod or Wisconsin synod don't think about denominations, they think about synods. Um, people from the, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America or from um, Lutheran Congregations and Mission for Christ think more in terms of denomination. Um, so, but you might ask that word, you know, what synod or denomination do you prefer? Um, and they might say, I don't care, right? Um, and, and many of them won't because the way we practice the sacraments, the way we treat people at dying is very much the same. Um, that's a good question. Any other questions? I was just yeah. going to bring up, it, you mentioned dispensationalism, which is a modern theology. And yeah. more important, church history historically is on the covenantal covenantal the theology, more or less, uh, or, you know, going, going yeah. back to Aquinas and Augustine. And, but do you have any ways of, you know, I don't want to take sidetracks on right. what we're going to talk about, but is there a more of a consistent streamline from those early church fathers that... Um, That's the big debate. Tie because the dispensationalists will say that they're, they're coming back to the early church fathers. And the Mennonites will say they are, and the Lutherans will say they are, and and you know, and so those are all things that are very different. So, you know, if if somebody doesn't know, right, there are things that are safe to do with everybody, right? Like dispensational theology um, is, you know, the great thing about that is there's just this this excitement about uh, life after death. Like this is this is going to be great, and so. If you find that somebody is really like looking forward to going home, they use that language of I'm going home. Um, they're using that language of, um, you know, I, I don't have to deal with this tribulation anymore. Um, you know, just just embrace that and just, yeah, amen, amen, you know, and everybody understands amen, right? So even, even if you don't believe it's something that's worth an amen, you have permission to say amen, right? Because for them, amen literally means let it be. And for them, that's what they need. Let, let what you, let that be for you. Let that be the way it is, right? And so I use that word so often, but I don't know what I'm getting into. And somebody, I, was, I, gave, I, I preached periodically at Orchard Ridge. And there was a gentleman that was there. And he was asking me some questions and I, I could tell, oh, this is going somewhere where uh, he's not going to like my answers. Um, but he's not somebody that I need to convince. I can honor him where he is in his faith. It's, there's no benefit in me changing his opinion about this particular thing. And so I just, man, I just started saying those amens. And he was uplifted and he left happy and I left happy. And it was a great conversation because at the end, we knew we were brothers in Christ. Uh, so, yeah. So you started to talk about, you know, end of life and how we treat pretty much everybody at end of life. Yeah. Can we move in that direction? Yes. Awesome. So as Lutherans, we have our heavy emphasis is on grace and forgiveness. This is true for all Lutherans. And so um, the... The key to this, kind of the easiest way to wrap this up is in Ephesians chapter 2, the first half of that. So you didn't think you were going to get out of here without a little preaching. Uh, so this is what Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of humanity. But, and as Lutherans, we call this God's big butt. So we like to make jokes about God's big butt. Here it is, God's big butt. But, God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, 
even when we were dead in our trans trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. Paul is writing to a church where people are misbehaving, where people are acting badly, and he is able to say with confidence that they are fully and completely saved. Not because they're behaving well, not because of their behavior, but because of who Jesus is. And so uh, we believe in the priesthood of all believers. So sometimes we talk about the office of keys. You might remember there's this story where Jesus asks Peter and the disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, yeah, you are. And on this rock, I am giving the keys of the kingdom. And then in John at the resurrection, they're in the upper room and Jesus breathes on them with his Holy Spirit. And she, you, have the, you have the duty to forgive sins. What you forgive is forgiven. What you don't forgive isn't forgiven or is bound. And so we have a responsibility to forgive sins, and that's not just for pastors. And this is important for those of you who are working with the dead and the dying, uh, is that you have the full authority, even if you think that Jesus was just a nutcase, and you don't believe that Jesus is real, Jesus believes in this reality. And so if you tell somebody, and, and this, right, you, you don't spend too much time with people who are in end-of-life situations before you run into somebody that's got something they need to confess, something that is on their heart, their mind, right? And sometimes it's not about sin. Sometimes it's about, you're, you're right, they're, maybe they're not regretting something they've done. Maybe they're regretting something they haven't done, whatever it is. And to hear that and to receive it and to let them know God has fully and completely forgiven you. You are, that is the full authority to do. You don't have to be a pastor. Now, if you can get a pastor to come in and do it, great, right? But you don't have to be a pastor to do it. Anybody can speak that word. And again, if, if you don't believe it, and you just think this is psychological mumbo-jumbo, but it's going to help this person, great. But as a Lutheran, I believe that when you say those words, it really happens. It really happens that that person is able to receive. And then they'll say, well, how do I know? How do I know that I'm forgiven? And this is where the sacraments come in. Um, the, the other thing about the priesthood of all believers, I just want to touch base on this, is Luther says that the priesthood of all believers isn't just about everybody always preaching or telling, right? It's about doing what you do well. So he says the Christian shoemaker doesn't live out the priesthood of all believers by putting little crosses on all the shoes or by preaching to everybody he sells a shoe suit. The Christian shoemaker lives out the priesthood of all believers by making really good shoes for everybody. Right? By doing what you do well. So if you're somebody that's in administration and you never come into contact with the folks that are over across the, the lawn there, you know what? What you do is sacred and important and it is blessed and it is so, so valuable. You are part of that priesthood nonetheless. <clears throat> so Lutherans understand the sacraments and we are two of them the Lord's Supper, and baptism. We understand the sacraments as something that God does, not something that we do. And because God does them, they can't be messed up. So in baptism, whether you're baptized as an infant, whether you're baptized when you're older, 
whether you're baptized after you choose to be baptized or you're baptized because your parents brought you and had you baptized, God in that baptism does a real work and makes a real promise to you. And then for Lutherans, when we baptize somebody, we take either water or oil and we mark them on the forehead with the cross and we say, you've been marked with the sign of the cross forever. So when you're dealing with a Lutheran and you can ask them, hey, were, were you baptized as a, a baby or a kiddo or when you're older? And they'll probably say, oh, I don't remember it. I was a baby. I was a baby. Oh. You know, when you were baptized, God claimed you as his own. God marked you. And you might take a little water or a little oil. And it can be any oil. It can be olive oil. It can be WD-40. You know, whatever you got. <laughs> I like oil better than water because that sensation, that feeling is going to be there. Right? Water is going to evaporate. It's going to soak in. It's going to be gone. Right? But a little bit of oil and just mark them. When you were baptized, you were marked with the cross of Christ forever. You are God's and there is nothing anyone can do or say about that. As Lutherans, we believe that God gives us in our baptism a real inheritance. Now, that inheritance is like an earthly inheritance, right? So uh, what was your name, sir? George. George. So George, do you know about your great, great aunt Gertrude? Oh, man, she was a bazillionaire, wealthy beyond belief. And George, when you were born, your parents sent a little photograph to Great Great Aunt Gertrude and a little birth announcement in the, in the mail. And Great Great Aunt Gertrude, oh, my goodness, look at this baby, George. Cute little bubble head, so beautiful. I just want to kiss him all over. And she's loaded. So she's got a lawyer. She calls up her lawyer and says, uh, Frederick, put baby George in the will for a million. All right. Well, you know, come many years later, you get a call. Now, Frederick's passed on, but Frederick's son, Frederick Jr., is, is the lawyer and says, hey, I got bad news for you. Your great, great aunt Gertrude died. Um, I'm so sorry for your loss, but uh, she left you a million dollars. I put it in a bank account, your name at Mountain West Bank. It's there for you. I'm sorry for your loss. Now, if George's parents never told him about great, great aunt Gertrude, he's never heard of her. He doesn't know anything about that. And so he thinks, oh, yeah. And there's a Nigerian prince that wants to marry me, too. Right. And he just he just leaves that million dollars in the bank. Does that do him any good? No, because he doesn't trust it. He doesn't trust that it's there. He doesn't do anything. But but if he has just enough faith, just enough trust, and he's like, I think I remember something about great great Aunt Gertrude. She was a nutcase. <laughs> I think I'm going to go over to Mountain West and see, see what they say about this. Right? Saving faith isn't perfect faith. It's not faith without doubt. It's just, just enough to trust that that's there for me. Could it be that God's salvation is for me? Could it be that God's forgiveness is for me? Could it be just that much? And you go and lo and behold, you got a big tax bill, but you also got you also got some money to spend, right? That's how Lutherans understand baptism. That in baptism you get this real salvation. And it's not just for life after death. It's not just for inheritance. It's the promise that God is with you today and yesterday and tomorrow and for always. That God wants what's best for you. That God loves you just the way you are. That there's no height, no depth, no width, no breadth, nothing in all of heaven or earth. Nothing you can do or say or fail to do or fail to say that can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That's Lutherans and baptism. And we just, just enough faith to just... Maybe that's for me, is what it takes to hold on to it. And so when you remind somebody of their baptism, a Lutheran, with that oil, right? And you might, you might take their hand if they're not able to take it themselves and just feel that. That's God's promise. And, and kids might come, what's this oil on dad's head? Oh, yeah. We anointed him with oil and reminded him of God's promises in baptism. Oh, Oh, okay. You don't have to be a pastor to do that. 
you don't have to have, you know, I, I, I don't know if you guys, do you have a kit here for people to use that's got like some oil with some sensor or something? I mean, that might be a good thing to have around, just some, yeah, that would be a good um, idea. and there are, there are oils that work better than others because they don't go rancid. Um, and so olive oil is not the best for long-term storage. Otherwise, you go, you open it up, and you go, oh, that's the wrong oil. Let's try something else, right? Um, Holy Communion is the same thing. It's not about something we do to show ourselves to God and say, God, I'm with you. And it's not something that we prepare ourselves for to get ourselves pure so that we can do it. Uh, in, in the Corinthian epistles, there's this thing about communion. And there's this part that says that the, if, if you fail to discern the body, then you take uh, the Lord's Supper unto your detriment. This is my paraphrase. Um, and so some people, some people believe that that means that you have to have gone through a process of confessing your sins and you have to be. So it's always good because, well, you'll see Lutherans don't worry about having confessed. If somebody's going to receive the Lord's Supper, you might just invite them. Would you like to take a moment of silence to confess to God anything that's on your heart? Um, right? And so are these things that you would offer at end of life if you got called into a patient's room? Or yes, something? and in an emergency, you can all do them too. Okay. So um, in an emergency as Lutherans, because God does the work, you can't mess it up. That's awesome. Right. So if somebody says they're a Lutheran and, and you call Pastor Matt and because he's, you know, a busy guy that's got two part time jobs and what have you, you know, I'll, I'll try my best to get over there. And boy, we're not going to have time. Just, OK, you know, just find some fruit juice, find some bread, get her done, you know. <laughs> um, so in communion, but if you look at that Corinthian epistle. Before that, the problem with communion is that not everybody is made to feel welcome, right? Directly before that, Paul's saying, look, some of you are not having enough to eat. Some are having plenty, right? And so, and when Paul talks about discerning the body, he's always talking about the church, the people. If you don't discern that this person next to you is your brother and sister in Christ, that they're welcome, then you're not celebrating the Lord's Supper. So this is how ELCA Lutherans understand this. Um, other Lutherans don't see it quite the same way, but all Lutherans understand that God does the work in Holy Communion. And so all Lutherans understand that in emergency situations, anyone can administer the sacrament. This is true for baptism as well. If you're working with somebody and... I, I don't know if I've ever been baptized or I know I, I never was baptized. I never was baptized. And um, you call, try to get a pastor. It's, it's not going to be time or kids, mom, dad are beyond the point of communication and they're worried. Oh boy. Dad went to church. I don't know if he's ever been baptized. There's an ethical thing here about baptizing people without their consent. And this is something that you have to figure out for yourself and in the moment and what's going on. I have trained um, labor and delivery nurses in baptism and how to baptize stillborn kiddos, babies that aren't going to make it. And, and what to do. And it's something as Lutherans, because this is something that God does. If this person who you're baptizing doesn't want this and it's, they're not, they're beyond the point of being able to experience it, but the kids want it. Um, boy, that's a dilemma. And in certain cases I would do it. And, I, and you have that discernment as well, because part of being Lutheran is this ability to sin boldly. That if you do the wrong thing, say you decide not to do it, and then oh, I don't know if I should have done that. Or not. God's not that person. Lutherans believe that the absence of baptism is not detrimental to our relationship with God, um, but the rejection of it is. So if your default is I'm just, this person's not able to do it, 
whatever, you can make that promise to the kids. Hey, you know what? God, it's not the, the absence of baptism that's problematic, but it is um, the rejection and your dad, your mom, your brother. Um, that's between them and God. Um, any thought? That was quick and a lot. I mean, kind of, um, if if you're doing, and do you, have, do you have like a chalice or platter or anything here that people can use if they want to? Is that something that you have? It's honestly never come on. Okay. I mean, I've baptized people before, but right. it's usually at home. The patient's yeah. asking right. for it. Um, so at somebody's home, if, if you're doing emergency, here's the thing. Pro tip, make it feel as sacred as possible. Okay. Right? Does it work with Wonder Bread and a juice box? Yes. <laughs> right? But, you know, this is a sacred moment. And so if you can, so, hey, do you have a nice wine glass? Oh, excellent. Do you, do you, have, um, do you have some nice bread? Oh, you've got that? Okay, let's, let's trim the crust off it. Let's make it a little round, right? And, you know, that Wonder Bread, squish the sign of the cross into the middle of it or something, right? Just... <laughs> Um, yeah. Well, I'm wondering too, like here we're talking about kind of emergency, right? right. So many of the patients are not even going to be able to. Right. They may not be able to. <laughs> so if somebody's not able to receive, right there, right. So um, what I do is, in that case, I'm celebrating with the family gathered, right? So all the people gathered are celebrating together, and I am um, taking the 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 cup. And just holding it to their lips. And I'm taking the the bread and I'm just holding it to their lips. And then um, I'm going to eat that bread. Is what I'm going to do. Um, so it's it's about sharing that for families that have been taking the sacrament. Lutherans receive the sacrament every week. So um, this is deeply ingrained in who we are. Yeah. Um, Lutherans are liturgical people, and so. Uh, across traditions, um, we have certain prayers that we sing and pray. We have certain hymns that we sing and pray um, regularly. And so though we can't tell you what our favorite hymn is, or we can't tell you the prayers we know, once you start saying them, they're going to start coming out of our lips. If somebody's German, or if they, if they have an accent that is a German accent, um, they probably have it memorized in German, the Lord's Prayer, for instance. Um, and so... Uh, the Apostles' Creed, these are things that are deeply embedded. You can find these on your phone. You can just say, like, Lutheran, Apostles' Creed. The reason you might want to put Lutheran there is because these are things that have been translated over the years. They're slightly different. Um, Lord's Prayer, Lutheran Lord's Prayer. We, we end the doc, with the doxology that Roman Catholics don't have. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Roman Catholics don't have that. They just um, say amen. They just say amen. Um, and so... Uh, you know, if you, when in doubt, and this is true for Presbyterians, it's true for, you know, um, Mennonites, right? You can say Mennonite, Lord's Prayer. Oh, okay. Um, and that's a German tradition. It's a little slight, it's translated from German, and that's a little awkward. Okay, got it, right? Just Google is amazing. <laughs> um, and so when I was chaplain, uh, the first time, my first day, there and the nurse manager was not this is in new england so uh this nurse manager might have been nurse ratchet uh she was a grumpy woman and um she called a chaplain <laughs> and i said oh what what would what do you think i should do today i don't know chaplain what should you do today how about a bible study <laughs> okay where should i do the bible study okay gave me this little tiny room with eight memory impaired people, uh, no honor, you know. And so I got an act like, I'm in my early 20s, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And I'm reading by, and I hand out Bibles. Clearly, this is not going to work. People are hitting each other with them. Let's take those Bibles back. Let's read, oh, this is not working. The volume is escalating. The temperature is escalating. Everything is going, ah, right? And I'm like, what the hell am I going to do? What am I doing here? Why did I take this job? Get me out of here, Lord Jesus. <laughs> and um, and so then I, I say, okay, well, let's, let's end with the Lord's Prayer. 
our Father who art in heaven. And as we go through that, by the end, everybody had joined in. There was calm and there was peace. And then all of a sudden, that was a great Bible study. <laughs> right? Um, hymns, that same group, this was later when I kind of had a sense of what I was doing. I asked the, the nurse manager, I said, hey, would it be okay if I did a hymn sing in the, in the dining room? I said, I don't know. Everybody could, I'm like, oh, we'll just, we'll see who shows up. And if other people join us, they can sit there and I don't know. So then when I was able to get an accompanist and we did it, she wasn't there that day. And uh, saying, got a list from the American Hymn Society of the most popular hymns in the United States and saying those 10 hymns. People had them memorized, right? We had them handed them out, but most of them were memorized. A couple days later, I come back and, you know, come through the doors. The nurse manager's office is right there to the left as I'm walking by. Chaplain! <laughs> walking there. I don't know what you did the other day. But that was the calmest night we've had here in years. Mm -hmm. And start doing hymn sings regularly. Right. Um, so there are tools I've I've got and uh, I'll talk with Jennifer about if this is something. So what I, I give with my white people to do stuff, we've got this little we call it a hymnal for visitation and pastoral care. And what it's got in there is a, a lay led Lord Supper celebration uh, it's got um some really well-known hymns hymns right you're not sure what hymns youtube i have like amazing grace right you know ask hey what's your favorite hymn oh i've never heard of that one youtube right if they don't know right they're not at a point you know what everybody knows the christmas carols right it doesn't it's july sure right bust, bust out the christmas carols jesus loves me right um, amazing grace. So we've just got eight in here that we use. Then I've got in here just some prayers that some people have memorized um, and are, are common. So like the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow, praise all God, all creatures here below. And then I've got some scripture for various things that people might come upon that are helpful. Um, but you can you can Google stuff, and I'm happy to make something up like that that you can have in a, a digital format that you can just hold on your phone and be like, oh, hey, here it is. Um, but it's just, and you can take one of these as well if you want. This is, um, so that's that's there. Yeah. I guess I would like you to, since we've got about 20 minutes left, yeah. to go into traditions at end of life, what, yeah. you know, I know we've gotten the how he must support us with the prayers, the hymns, yep. the baptism and communion. And that's really good to know. Right. I've shied away from giving communion. Yeah. So, um, but what are there tradition, different things? So, body there is anything. So, you know, um, that, that ends up being more of a national thing than a, so Swedes and Danes and Germans and South American people from, but we have in our congregation, some Brazilians, um, you know, there's a lot of Lutherans in Brazil. Um, so the, the big thing is for us is, um, this, this is, you know this, right? But in, you guys are so good at this, right? So good. I don't need to tell you this, but I, I just want to celebrate it with you and, and reinforce this. With the way you touch and hold people as they're dying or after they've died, the way that you speak to people as they're dying or after they've died, the way that you sing and pray, the laugh, the cry, the way that you behave gives permission for people that don't know what they're doing, right? So when, when you you know, sit and take somebody by the hand while they're talking to them and look into their eyes, even though their eyes are closed. Oh, I can do that. I can do that with mom, right? Um, and so it's just a dignity thing, right? And you, you know this, this is, this is nothing that is new or, but this is, this is what as Lutherans, you know, there's nothing special about not cremating the body or cremating the body. Um, there's 
you know, nothing about um, embalming or not embalming about a certain amount of time or this or that. Um, so just give permission to hold, to laugh, to sing, to tell those stories, right? And, you know, one of my favorite things to do is when, you know, loved ones are around and if I can either sit as close on to the bed or even on the bed and hold the person's arm or, you know, wrap my arm around them depending on, on the situation or what have you and, um, you know, tell me a story about when mom got really mad at you, right? And, oh yeah. And then as they're telling the story, you know, hey, oh, here, you come here. And then do the little switch room so all of a sudden they're in your place um, and, and usher them into that position so that they have, um, you know, one of the hardest things I ever had to do as a chaplain was a uh, uh, kiddo that had died of SIDS and the EMTs knew when they got there that this kiddo had passed away. Um, the doctors, the nurses all knew it, but nobody had told them, right? And the family knew, but they, they were hoping that, right? Like the kiddo was very cold, very cold. And um, then to be with that family and to you know, hold that kiddo in my arms and, and just wrap it dearly and tight and then allow mom to come and, and hold it with me and then hand it into her arms and let dad come and, and do the same. And because there's just so much fear about hurting and particularly as people are dying, people are worried, well, am I gonna hurt mom? Am I gonna hurt dad? What if I, you know, and you know that better than they do or I do, right? Like. So um, that's my biggest thing is just empower the family to embrace, to laugh, to tell those stories, to talk directly to the person. Um, and I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> right? Yeah. Any um, things about after the person dies, cremation is fine, burial is fine. fine, burial is fine, composting is uh, fine, composting is fine. Uh, involvement is fine, non-involvement <laughs> is fine. Um, you know, we do uh, water cremation here in town now, that's, that's fine. Um, and people wonder about that, right? So um, cremation is not mentioned anywhere specifically in, in the Bible, but um, specifically mentioned is that those who are lost at sea will be resurrected. Well, if God can resurrect those that have been eaten by fishes, you know, cremation is not a big deal. That's the statue to dust to dust. Yes. I, uh, I, there was a woman, so my little dairy farming community was a little, little crazy. There's a woman in my church who had a neurological condition that had to have parts of her body amputated at various times. She had convinced the doctor to let her keep all those parts in the freezer at her house. <laughs> this does not happen anymore. <laughs> right? Her house happened to be across the church parking lot. And so she would ask me, you know, hey, you want to you come see my leg? <laughs> my dad was a veterinarian. I was used to dead bodies. We had dead animals that had been dissected and stuff in a whole separate freezer in my house. So this wasn't too odd to me, turns out. But she, she, she said, well... I know I'm made in God's image, and I really love jigsaw puzzles. So I'm I'm making God one heck of a puzzle when I'm resurrected. <laughs> you know, it's it's don't take ourselves too seriously. Take the promises of God with all seriousness. No. Yeah. Um. Yeah, is that helpful? I mean, there's just, there's not a lot because, because you can't mess it up. We really believe it can be, God's grace cannot be messed up. It's not magic, right? You don't have to have the, you don't have to be a witch or wizard, right? 
You don't have to flick the wand just right or have the right kind of juice or the right kind of bread. You don't have to um, say the words exactly right. Right? There are words that we use when we baptize. We baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we use water three times. When we give the Holy Supper, we say this is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Martin Luther says that's the most important sermon anybody can ever hear. Us long-winded preachers haven't understood that. We think our sermons are better, but, um, but the, you know, this is for you is really it. Yeah. So we should expect that somebody who is been Lutheran, yep. phenomenon or consistently would find comfort in being reminded that they were likely baptized. Yes. And also, since they're used to taking communion once a week, right. that would be something they might be interested in yes okay and they would and they would probably be very interested in trying to do that with their family around them mm -hmm. even if their family are no longer going to church right that they would that you know for for mom or dad to have their kids their grandkids around them one more time and celebrate the lord's supper together um that's a a deep balm um and and if yeah at whatever at a level the, the client's able to participate do you have any advice on you know uh, uh for a believer or their family's a believer already yeah but there there's a lot of fear because you know even though we're believers we don't know yep. exactly how it's going to play out right like when you Transfer. So is there in personal experience, do you have certain verses you point towards that have been really helpful or things you do or say? I, I love the, the joke passage um, because it doesn't get too detailed, but it just celebrates this, this promise that um, though my body may rot away, I will see with mine own eyes my Redeemer and my Redeemer lives, right? Uh, I, my brain doesn't remember numbers. I'm really good with numbers, so I, I don't have the scripture reference for you, but okay. if you Google Job, my redeemer lives. That's that's one of those deep promises. Um, uh, that Paul writes, uh, let me tell you a secret. The dead are not gone. Um, that's part of the, the funeral liturgy. And um, there's. But I, I think the, and, and then the, the end of Revelation, right? So this new heaven and this new earth, that every tear will be wiped dry, pain and suffering will be no more, death will meet its demise. That's part of Revelation 22, I think, maybe 21, mm -hmm. which is an echo from Isaiah, right? That um, there will come a day when every tear is wiped dry, where pain and suffering will be no more, and where death has been obliterated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in hospice, as Lutheran's death is this thing where um, it's not the way it's supposed to be. Like we we fully say, yep, God never desires for us to be separated from our loved ones, whether it be by broken relationships, whether it be by death, whether it be by God never desires that. That's the enemy. And in that way, death is still the enemy. Right. But. We also fully embrace, embrace that, that Easter proclamation that, oh, death, where is thy sting? Um, you are destroyed. That when Jesus rose from the dead, that means that we will never taste death. That though we will die physically, we will not taste death. That we will experience only resurrection. Um, and so um, there's that promise as well. Um, so it's okay to have these mixed emotions, which you've experienced, right? This um gosh I, I don't know what i'm gonna do without without my husband i don't know what i'm gonna do and and i just i can't wait for him to be uh, at peace and not to hurt anymore but i don't know what i'm gonna do and i i want him to be free and i don't know what i'm gonna do yeah what is your or the church's um, opinion of suicide do you believe that a person who commits suicide goes to hell? No. For, there is a hell. Uh, well, let me answer the first first. <laughs> uh, so, and this, and this one I can speak for, for the church. 
we we believe that suicide is the same as dying from cancer. It is a product of disease, right? Mental health is a disease. And, and in the same way that somebody who dies of cancer, right, it might actually be pneumonia or it might actually be, right, like, but it's chemo, right? Suicide is, is the final way that somebody dies, but it's the disease that has killed them. And so, um, thank you. That that is is not an issue because, yeah. Um, now I'm going to take off. I'm no longer speaking for the church. I'm speaking for me. Um, I do not believe in an eternal conscious suffering of the damned. Um, that is a minority opinion for the church, and. It may or may not be a minority opinion in my tribe in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Um, and it's more complicated than that. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to see everyone in eternity. Um, but I don't believe there's an eternal conscious suffering of the damned. That I have a deep conviction about. Um, and... Yeah, I've actually written articles that have been published on this, so I don't want to, I could, I could go on a long time there, but um, when God gives the promise that all things are being reconciled unto himself, and all means all, all means all, and so if, um, what does that look like? There's also talk about this second fire and second death, and so maybe what that means is that there are, I, what I certainly hope it means is that for me, the parts of my life that are not the way they're supposed to be, the parts of my life that are not in line with who God made me to be, will be obliterated. And I won't, I won't have to worry about them anymore. They won't be part of me. And I, I just get to join that great choir um, made up of people of every tribe, nation, tongue, and race. And I and live next door to Jesus. Um, but I also think that salvation is predominantly about life today, not just about eternity. So... Um, but that, that's a nuanced position and not an official Lutheran position. Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. But it's not something I'm going to get defrocked for either, so it's okay that it's on video. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions or thoughts or wonderings? I hope this has been helpful. I hope it's been interesting. Um, I think so. I actually like your theatrical performances. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. I appreciated the history. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I just want to emphasize, I hope that you, I don't know where you are in your journey of faith. I don't know what you believe or, or what your relationship was with, with, God, but that doesn't change the fact in my mind that you are agents of God's blessing in this community. I'm just so thankful for all that this organization does and that you do. And you're not going to get it right every time. And God's grace is sufficient for that. And there are times that you're going to get it right when you thought you got it all the way wrong and you're never not going to know that you got it right. So hold, hold your self-judgment very loosely and then let it go. Um, because we need you. We need you in this community. Yeah. Seems like a good spot to end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Here's my, if anybody wants my contact information or if you have questions that you didn't feel like at, you were comfortable asking in a group or um, other thoughts, feel free to contact me or if you're ever looking for a mediator because you've got conflict in your life, um, do everything from divorce and child custody to families, try and figure out how to live together and things like that. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.